responsible for uh, the patterns that we see in the data. And uh, um, after analyzing some of the statistical features of the contact probabilities that are emerging from high C and gamma experiments, uh, I moved on to uh, discuss some a simple, very, very simple and schematic model of what could be some of the mechanisms underlying chromosome folding. And you remember, we uh, delved into the strings and binders model. The concept behind is very, very basic. The idea is that along a sequence, a DNA sequence, <coughs> you have binding sites in red in the figure for the binders of the strings and binders model. And so by diffusion, the binders can bridge uh, those binding sites, and they can loop the polymer and fold it. And the key message is that now independently, this is the lesson from polymer physics, independently on the little uh, fine details of the model, of the specific model you consider, I mean, the interaction potential or anything like that, uh, this type of self-interacting polymers have a phase diagram which looks like the one summarized here. And on the x-axis, you have the concentration of the binders. And on the y-axis, you have the binding affinity. How strong is the binding energy of a binder to its cognate uh, binding site? And interestingly, say, a broad class of, of uh, interacting polymers have the coil-to-globule transition. So you have a transition point, which is this the theta line here, and you move from a phase where the polymer is in a coil state, so randomly open and folded, to a state where it is instead collapsed into a globular lump. And the two are, say, two distinct universality classes. And so the idea is that a filament of DNA uh, or different portions along such a filament could be in either one or the other of those fundamental thermodynamic states. Of course, this is a far from trivial assumptions, but what I tried to show you yesterday is that, for instance, average contact probabilities can be decently well described by this kind of assumption. So literally starting from the textbooks of the 80s, you can compute the contact probabilities in the two states, you consider a mixture, and you can explain over three orders of magnitude, with really not much fitting parameters, just one, the composition of the mixture, the, the counter probability, the average counter probability is shown uh, from the data. What I also uh, try to delve into is to describe another type of, of data, which comes not from high C, but from fish, that is to say, microscopy. With microscopy, if you label different DNA sites, you can access the physical distance between those two sites. And you can measure that, and you can compute distributions and moments. In particular, I try to take your attention on uh, the so-called moment ratio, which is, you see, the, 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 the ratio of the average of the fourth power of the distance of the two sites of interest divided by the square of the average squared distance. This is an important quantity in polymer physics because this is dimensionless. So either your model describes this in a, in a good way or you have no fine-tuning parameters or whatever. And what I showed you beneath is uh, a collection of experimental data. I understood that I have to explain this again, so let me go through it again. What I'm showing you here is a number of experimental data points uh, uh, taken from that paper. And the different colors correspond to different chromosomes, different uh, loci on those chromosomes, different cell types. And on the y-axis, you have the experimental recorded moment ratio. And on the x-axis, the data is ordered in such a way that, you see, they're ordered, uh, ordered according to the genomic distance of the two sites considered. So, for instance, that point corresponds to two sites which are, are at 
roughly one-tenth of a megabase apart. That point is at 10 megabase apart. And what is surprising, this is what I tried to convey yesterday, but I understood I wasn't good enough. What is interesting is that, you see, there is an accumulation point from above at around three halves. Whatever the distance, the genomic distance, whatever the cell type, whatever the locus, whatever the chromosome, roughly they all come to 1.5 from above. Why? And what I'm showing you here on the right instead is what is the prediction of equilibrium polymer physics. If you take the two thermodynamic phases I told you about, the coil and the globular thermodynamic phase of an interacting polymer, you know that uh, in the bulk of the thermodynamic phase, the distribution of fluctuations is Gaussian. And so the moment ratio must be exactly 3 out. So what I'm showing you here, the x-axis is different. The y-axis is as before, the moment ratio. The x-axis here is an axis that allows us to move across the, the theta point, the transition point. So at low concentration, you remember, our polymer is in the open state. And in fact, you get three halves for the moment ratio. When you cross the transition and you move into the contact state, the globular phase, again, you see, you get three halves because once again, the system is Gaussian. It is well known instead that around the transition at the critical point, fluctuations are no longer Gaussians and the moment ratio shoots up. And interestingly, the scale spanned is very similar to the scale that you see in the experiments. And so this is telling us that, well, we understand, first, why there is a, an accumulation point at three halves. Second, why it is from above and not from below. Third, that many, many experiments maybe have been conducted really in sites which are in either the open or the closed phase, because they are close to three halves. And there are other loci, other regions, which have scattered out of the three halves accumulation point. However, they, you see, they well reside within the range predicted by those toy models, which could imply that those sites are moving across the transition from open to compact or the other way around. So, summarizing, the impression we have when we look at average contact data average distance data, that we can make sense of them all by simple concepts of basic polymer physics. The next step I wanted to, to attack uh, is patterns. Because models such as the fractal globin model or the self work model of polymers cannot explain uh, patterns, CADs and so on. If you look at their content matrices in a self avoiding walk, it's uniform. It is only a, an average genomic distance effect. And instead, we want to understand what's the origin of the patterns we see in the data, because that, that is where the action is. And so I, uh, yesterday, I uh, <coughs> closed my lecture trying to uh, give you a sense of how, within this context of the strings and binders model, or any other self-interacting polymer model, you can make sense of the pattern. And the, I consider a, a variant of the toy model I showed you before, where now you have two colors, in the sense that along the, the polymer chain, still a toy model, along the polymer chain, though, there are two types of binding sites, red and green. The red binding sites are bridged by red binders, and the green binding sites by the green binders. And for such a system, really, uh, it's easy to guess how it falls from what we just discussed. Because you immediately see that it falls like, like that. And all the possible combinations of the different thermodynamic phases. 
So you form a red and a green lump. And they are not technical, they are not independent, because there is still a portion of the polymer which holds them together. But they are almost independent. And so if you map in this toy model the content matrix, it has two blocks, similar to what is seen in the experiment, the TANS. And uh, you must now start guessing, how can I produce more complex patterns? And I, again, give you, gave you a, an example of how you can obtain higher order uh, domains. And in, in, uh, in the evolution of the toy model I, I discussed, I consider the variant now, where not only you have the two uh, red and green binding sites, but now you had a blue set of binding sites which go across the two subsets, the red and the green. Again, here it's easy to understand what is happening, uh, though uh, maybe it's less trivial than before. Because interestingly, uh, it turns out that the red and the green first come together, each on its own. And then the blue binding sites bring together the two previously independent domains. And you form a high order structure which looks like that in the toy model. No, 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 this is uh, equilibrium. The reason why uh, you keep the two, the red and the green in uh, um, compact and then the, the blue bridge together uh, is, is just a matter of, um, say, genomic proximity. It is much easier for the, re for the red, say, to come together first because they are localized and the green the same. And, and then, only then, it, you start bridging the blue. But, but this is the equilibrium, so it's not a, a, a matter of time. But nevertheless, yes, there are, can be lots of complication in this kind of things. So uh, by, in, in this toy model, uh, you see that you start producing interactions across the two blocks where, which previously were virtually independent. And once again, this is to try to visualize how you can obtain higher order patterns, such as the mated hats that we discussed yesterday. However, uh, this was sort of, of uh, basic introduction to give you a sense of how patterns can emerge in, uh, in, in models such as the single binders or uh, in self-interacting polymer models. However, this can be pushed to, to match real data to good accuracy. And this is what I want now to discuss. So what you see on the top here is now, uh, you're well familiar with that, high C data. So contact probabilities, uh, to be short. And this is a region of roughly five, six mega around an important gene, FA4, a gene which is involved in, in uh, embryo development, and I will show you is linked to human diseases, congenital diseases. And what you see, what you see up here is, is the, the patterns of contacts across that region. You see, for instance, that there is a, a TAD or a metatad which encompasses FA4. This is the enhancer of FA4. This is the regulator of FA4. And instead here, there is sort of looser structure and here, little TADs or whatever, sub -tads. you know, the definition of TADs and sub -tads, as I stress, this is very, very loose. Here, instead, you see uh, what the strings and binders model uh, does. And overall, you see the agreement is, is comparatively good, considering the simplicity of the ingredients that we have in this type of model. So not only the average behavior is, is, is reproduced, but, but also the structure of the patterns, the sub tads and, and, and so on, whatever they are. The correlation overall is 95%. And this type of, of, of 
quality uh, of explanation of experimental data is, is found genome-wide with this type of models. So the, we can explain the way in which the genome fold, the entire genome fold, and 95% of accuracy with this type of, of methods. And you see here, a, since now we have the polymer model of that, we can, uh, we can reconstruct the 3D structures which correspond to that. And notice this is not one structure. You have to imagine this in, in a statistical mechanics sense. So the polymer folds in its thermodynamic phase, and then you, you see it's moving. There's not one state. There's a, an entropy associated. So different, many different conformations. If you, this is a PDF, but uh, I also have movies that I can show you. But, but we have to imagine that uh, the polymer is, is breathing, is, is moving in time. So the contacts that you see there are sort of average over time. At a given time point, you may only see some of them. And you may start guessing what is a TAD or a meta-TAD or whatever uh, are those I.O. structures. For instance, look at, look at here. The, the, the color scheme here is, is the one corresponding to, to that strip. And so you see, this little sub or whatever is, is associated to that color, dark red, then pink, maroon, and so on. And you see how it folds in a complex conformation. It folds, bends on itself. And that's the, what heuristically would have called, we would have called the meta tat. And, uh, and you may see that here, there are, for instance, structures uh, which correspond to tads or something. They are because... You see, these two regions, which maybe are responsible for the two subtypes, are also folding together, and so on. Of course, there is a price to pay for that, because the model is no longer as simple as the toy models I showed you before, where you have distinct sectors for colors, but, and you have a few colors here to explain the data, 12 main colors have to be introduced. So the models predict that there are at least 12 main different colors, and overall 24. So the model is predicting that there are order of magnitude a dozen factors, particles, which mediate the interaction. And then I will tell you how one can go and look for them, exactly how as we do in high energy physics. We predict that there is a particle which is, has an opposite charge with respect to electrons and, and go and look for it. So what I would like to do now is to give you a sense of what those uh, binding factors, at least within the model, which of course can be wrong, because what I'm showing you now is a fit. I will tell you later on how we tested this. But by now, this could be all wrong. This is just a fit. Anyway, I want to try to give you a sense of what those binding sites are. So, um, I told you that the model, this is a cartoon of that region, uh, has roughly 12 or so colors. And what you see here is the distribution of the different types of binding sites along the DNA sequence. So you see, for instance, there is a, a bunch of green binding sites here at the beginning. And they may be responsible for that little sub tad there. And then there is another bunch immediately after, which is a distinct type, and so on. So an explanation of what tads are is emerging. If there are regions where there is a dominant type of binding sites, you see, of course, a specific <laughs> pattern there of interaction. But that's it. And now we understand from fundamental principles how that arises. Notice also that there are binding domains, such as this one word, the pink, which are spread along the region. This is producing long-range contacts. And so the interactions between the tabs, if you want, and so the arising of, of metatads in higher order structures. Once you have the modal predictions about the binding sites, an obvious thing to do is to try to see whether they correlate 
with some known factors or some specific type of sequences along the genome. You can ask, what are the typical binding sites that correlate with yellow? Or is CTCF, you remember that protein which was so important, uh, is CTCF correlated with some of those binding sites? I mean, look at where yellow is. Is CTCF located where yellow is? And so on. And of course, you can run that type of analysis. And the result is summarized here. So what you see listed here uh, is a number of chromatin factors. I'm not entering into many details, but if you want, I'm happy to. Some of those, you have seen them. CTCF, you recognize CTCF. Pol2 is a polymerase. And what you have here instead is the different types of colors, so green, red, and so on. And what this has shown us is that a single color predicted by the model, in general, is not a single protein, a single molecule, but is a combination of. So just a few protein factors, just a few molecular factors, can produce a combinatorially large number of different types of binding sites. And in this way, with few chemical ingredients, you can produce the complexity of factors that we are discussing. Just for CTC have, let me give you a sense of what I'm trying to say. You see, CTC have is not correlated with only one color, but it correlates with this, with the neighboring one, with that one, and, and so on. And CTC have is also associated with, comes with other factors, and in different combinations according to different colors. And by the way, what we found is that there is a subgroup of colors at in, for this locus, locus in biology means for this region, roughly 30% of the colors which do not correlate with known factors, but they are important to explain the architecture of locus. And so this is the potential discovery of new particles, new factors, which must yet to be discovered, which are responsible for the formation of the architecture. So a very quick uh, explanation of how we guess the model. And this is machine learning. And I'm not entering into details. You have a lot of that. And it is the following. Starting from, you know, Good old physics, you guess at each term of a, the standard model one by one. Now with the advancement of computers and so on, starting from experimental data, we can have a machine learning approach to try to guess which are the colors, where they are located, what's the minimal model that you need to introduce, explain the data, and so on. And so we developed Prisma, which is a machine learning algorithm to do that. And it's very easy. I just want to give you the flavor of what we do. Suppose you, you know that your system has a given contact matrix. You can ask, what's the minimal optimal model, which, based only on the strings and binders uh, physics, explains the data? And so this is what we do. And in this way, we predict the colors, the minimal number of colors, so binding domains along the uh, the polymer, which explains those data. But uh, machine learning here is only a complicated name to say, let's try to make a fit with the power of computers we have today. But that's it. Of course, once we have the, the polymer, the, the, sorry, the model, the Hamiltonian of the system, we can start asking all sorts of questions, including, for instance, what's the effect of a mutation? And this is what I now want to discuss. We thought that a stringent test of this type of models would be to make predictions on the effects of mutations. Because up to now, this is a fit. I showed you we can explain the data with very good accuracy, it all works, and so on. But 
How can we test that as we do in theoretical physics? Well, if you think about, uh, or at least we thought about that, a very stringent test is predicting the effects of mutations. The idea is the following. Suppose you know your model for uh, y, your Y-type logos. Y-type in, bio, in biology means the normal genome. So you know what's the polymer which describes the normal case for your genomic region of interest. The idea is that you can implement a mutation in that. So for instance, you have a deletion in the example shown. You take out that portion, that segment. And then, out of only theoretical physics, you predict how the system reforms, what would be the contact matrix. And I call this a stringent test because there are no whatsoever fitting parameters. Take your polymer model and you just compute polymer physics. So you compute the contact matrix and you compare it with experiments. And we did that not just for a deletion. We did a lot for deletions, uh, duplications, inversions, so all sorts of mutations to see whether we can explain, predict uh, their effects and compare, test the model against experiments in cells bearing exactly those mutations. And so this is the way we tested the model. And additionally, of course, the excitement is that you can do that for mutations which are linked to human diseases to see if out of theoretical physics we can predict whether a child will have a malformed limb or, or so. And this is what I want to show you now. So uh, this is the data you've seen before. This is the FA4 region. The FA4 gene, you remember the, the TAD or beta TAD you see there and so on. And, and this is the model and this is the experiment I showed you before. Now, we consider the del B plus uh, deletion. This is a deletion which you see cuts that portion of the region. So it takes out FA4. And this is what the model predicts. When you take the Y type, the original model, and you take that out, the model predicts that the system refolds like that. So contacts are rearranged in the way you see. And Stefan Mundlos in Berlin uh, run independent experiments, blind tests of the model, in cells carrying exactly the same mutation. And that mutation was, sh was chosen because this is a, we have a patient with brachydactyly because that mutation is known to produce brachydactyly. That is to say, as you see, uh, malformation of your limbs. And this is the experimental uh, data. I think this is interesting because you see, not only the, the model predicts overall the contact patterns that you see in the data. But what I, what I find exciting is that the model predicts new contacts in the terminology of biologists, ectopic contacts. So regions of contacts which are absent in the original system. And so you would have no way to predict, starting from only experimental data, and they are confirmed in the experiments. And those contacts are responsible for the disease. I try to explain you why. You see, when you take out that section, that segment, the new contacts imply that there is that region in dark blue which starts interacting with that other region. And the first 
is the region where the enhancer of FA4 is sitting. So the enhancer of FA4, rather than interacting with FA4 in the mutated system, starts interacting with the next gene, PAX3. So the enhancer has a wrong target. This is what physics predicts and is confirmed experimentally. It's a wrong target and activates the wrong gene. And this is what Stefan showed. PAX3 is upregulated and leads to the disease. So, by the way, you see here the three d structures, how they refold and so on, but, but I don't want to delve into many details. And of course, we repeated that for a number of cases. This is Delby, I showed you, but this is a duplication. So the duplication means that that region has been duplicated. In that duplication, which brings, uh, gives syndactyly another limb malformation, but it's a patient with that. I stress this. This is not an ideal world. This is hard life world. So in this case, the model predicts that you see that there are ectopic contacts here. In this case, the second enhancer of FA4 that you add by the duplication activates Win6, that other gene, which is upregulated in the mutated cells and brings and, and, and uh, uh, gives the, the malformation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mutation? What do you mean? Oh, no, that, that's a more complex story. We, we are going one step at a time. By now we can tell, look, if you have that mutation, a given set of genes will be affected. And if you know what, they gene, what those genes do, then you can think that they may have a phenotype. So you may have a, a, a disease or something. By now, we can only tell out of physics whether a given gene, genetic mutation will impact the regulation of some gene. OK, so uh, to, to wrap up. I, I think this type of results are exciting for at least two reasons. From the point of view of the theoretical physicist, this is very exciting. It's simple concepts of polymer physics of the 80s. We can predict how our genome folds, how our, our genes are regulated, which an answer contact which gene. You see, we are really delving into the fundamental of of how life works. On the other, the other reason of excitement is that as much as with pencil and paper, we could predict the existence of the Higgs boson, as theoretical physicists, now we can tell a kid if he's going to have a disease. And we can do that not just for the few mutations which impact one gene, but we can do that for every single mutation, including those in, non, in the non-coding part of our genome. And so you see the promise here is that we can really change medicine, genetic diagnostic, which today is really a, a discipline in its infancy. This is bringing a quantitative level to, to, uh, to genetics. In the five time, I will tell you how this can open huge uh, implications in business. Of course, these type of results are not restricted to the region I showed you. Uh, we have data genome-wide. I want to go fast. This is another region, another disease-associated region. This is a human-associated region. And again, you can redo all what I explained to you, but I don't want to, to spend too much time on that. And another, another 
the type of implications you, you can extract from physics is, is to derive not just the pairwise contact matrix, but you can establish what are contacts overall. So you can see if there are triplets, if there are cases where a given gene is controlled not by, by one regulator, but by two, by three, four. And what we discovered is that, in fact, there are lots of combinatorial regulation of genes. So for instance, uh, there are lots of many body contacts. They are exponentially more abundant of what you would expect in a randomly folded polymer. And we made predictions on that. We expect those three regulators come together to that gene. In the technology I showed you, the, our technology, GAM, uh, was the first to, capable at assessing multiple contacts. Because IC, at least in the original version, can only measure pairwise contact. With GAM, instead, you can, I don't know if you remember that, that's the technology where you extract slices and you count who's in. Since that's all statistics, you can also extract what are triplets, quadruplets of interactions. And with GAM, uh, we indeed show that, that there are multiple contacts. Regulatory processes are very complex. They can involve higher, highly sophisticated um, uh, regulatory uh, landscapes for, for the genes. And now, uh, for sake of, let, let me skip that. But the key message is that we predict also multiple uh, regulatory contacts, and they can be, they've been confirmed experimentally once again. This. Um, this is an example of the modal predictions in entire chromosomes. This is entire chromosome 11. This is real data. This is the modal. And again, correlation 95% and so on. Let me skip this. So before the break, what I would like to discuss instead now is um, I told you that with, with the model you predict that there are particles, new particles which mediate the interactions. Of course, we wanted to, to go and find them. And I want to show you an example where we did that. And again, very close analogy to high energy physics if you want. Though this is low energy chemistry, I would call it this way. So uh, to do that, we considered a, a simple locus, a simple region, a region where there are few colors. And so it's easy to, to go and, and, and test for the particles which mediate the interactions. And the region we considered is the Hoxby locus. This is the name that I will just give to it. The Hoxby is a cluster of genes which are important in development. And what I'm showing you is that region, it's a roughly one mega around that cluster, uh, in mouse embryonic stem cells. So where you can do all sorts of experiments without ethical or with minor ethical implications and so on. And uh, you see, this, this region is marked basically by two colors, red and green, as in the toy model I showed you. And so starting from the colors, uh, predicted by the model, you can produce the content matrices. Theoretically, you can say, I expect that, say, SNF8 interacts with an SX, SNX11. Uh, SNX11 is here. SNF8 is here. And there is roughly one megabase. So you see, with the model, you can extract non-trivial implications, non-trivial predictions. There are two genes which are one mega apart, and you predict a common contact. And you also predict that this must be a factor, a green factor, which enables the contact. And Anna Pombo in Berlin uh, ran the experiments to test this. And not only she ran um, high C, but also cryofish, so an advanced version of fish microscopy, which has a very high resolution. 
And to cut short the long story, what, what she found is that the modal the set of pack, the set of contacts found in the modal is indeed found experimentally. But she ran triple co-localization experiments. So by fluorescence, fluorescence, not only she marked the two genes of interest, say SNF8 and SNX11. So those two are marked. But she also marked the proteins, which we guessed could be involved in the contact. And you see here red, sorry, green is chosen because the genes are active. And so the guess was, pole two must be involved. And in fact, by triple colocalization experiment, she found that pole two is involved. So that is one of the components of the molecular factor which holds the two genes together. The red genes are a different class. Red genes are now named poise genes. So genes where you, where the genes is almost active in the sense that there is another factor which prevents Pol2 from, from uh, transcribing, from a full transcription. And that's linked to PRC2, another chemical factor. And what Anna showed is that PRC2 co-localized with, with, with red genes. So that's one of the factors involved in, in bringing together the red genes in this toy model. So this is an example where we know the folding, use it that to guess what could be the particles, the molecules which mediate the interactions, and we found at least some of the particles which mediate the interaction. And this type of models can be used to test a number of different hypotheses. For instance, as I showed you, CTCF is involved in in, in uh, genome folding. And so one could use the models to test whether CTCF is responsible for the folding of the locus. One way to do so is to create a model of the region where you see, you think that it's CTCF responsible for the contacts. And so you map the CTCF binding sites, which are the orange one, and from that model you extract out of polymer physics, what would be the expected content matrix? And you can do that also in other scenarios. You can say, no, it's pole 2 only which produce contacts. And so you can map where pole 2, to, where pole two binds. Pole 2 is the polymerase. And you can see what is the appearance of the content matrix in that scenario. And this is instead the scenario which I, I showed you before, to cut short a longer story. <laughs> And of course, in this scenario, the one I discussed, you can have also different sub-scenarios. I try to, I delve into that to give you the sense of how far you can go with this type of predictions. The scenario shown here, which is the one I discussed before, is where red and green fold in the same cell at the same time. In this variant, your cell population is a mixture in a fraction of cells, the green come together, but the red are not. And the, in the other fraction of cells, the red come together, but the green not. And so you can distinguish the two out of polymer physics, because you have this different patterns in the contact. And so when they run the experiments, they allow us to, to dissect which of those different scenarios are the correct one. And so the conclusion we came to, which gave the cover to, to nature genetics, is that it is homotypic interaction, simultaneous homotypic interaction. That is to say, you see, the pattern found experimentally uh, corresponds to that situation, where in the same cell, the red come together and the green come together at the same time. And instead, in this case, CTCF doesn't work. CTCF doesn't explain folding, which doesn't imply that, as I will show you later, that CTCF is not important in folding in a number of other cases. 
Okay, so it's roughly 10 o'clock, so I would stop for 15 minutes. We can meet again at uh, quarter past and uh, try to wrap up. Okay, guys, so shall we start again? Okay, so if more or less we are all back. So let's let's start again. Let's try to wrap up. Come on. Okay, in the last few minutes of uh, my lectures, what I want to trying to discuss with you is, a, is another type of uh, mechanism which we think could be underlying chromosome folding. I discussed a scenario which is a classical scenario of biology, where you have molecules which thermodynamically bridge cognate binding sites on a chromosome. And there are plenty of examples now about that. However, there's another classical scenario in biology, whereby there is an active mechanism of loop extrusion. The idea is that you have another type of molecules which bind to DNA and start extruding a loop. And the candidate for that has been envisaged in, uh, in the combination of CTCF and cohesin. So this is what I want to discuss now. The idea is the following. I showed you how CTCF is an important molecule uh, involved in, in, in chromosome folding. What uh, these people envisage uh, is, a, is a scenario uh, which I would describe as a not equilibrium uh, scenario, not based on, on thermodynamics as the one I discussed before. In this picture, you have that, uh, let me try to draw the picture. You have DNA, and along the, the sequence, a molecule binds, which is an active motor. So the molecule binds and start actively extruding a loop of DNA. So that, at a later time, becomes that, and at later time, becomes that, and so on. The idea is that you spend energy. So while in the previous scenario, the thermodynamic scenario, if you think about, the cell has no need of burning energy, because the energy required is absorbed by the thermal bath, so free, no problem. In this scenario instead, that is a, a, a molecular motor which extrudes DNA actively. And 
the idea is that that motor stops when it finds CTC have binding sites. Interestingly, oppositely directed CTC have binding sites. I see. You still have not developed the ability to look through. This is the next step in this course. It was, uh, so you saw that. This is a molecule which binds an active motor. The active motor starts extruding a DNA loop, forcing this out. So you spend energy, ATP, and step by step the loop becomes larger and larger. And in the order's idea, the, the motor stops when it enca uh, encounters oppositely directed CTCF binding sites. So this is a CTCF uh, binding site, and this is another. When the two are uh, brought in the molecular machinery, it stops. And so this has been named the loop extrusion model. And uh, uh, the, the molecular factors involved have been envisaged to be uh, CTCF, as I told you, the two oppositely directed CTCF, CTCF sites are here shown as the uh, green and the red. And the yellow molecule is the extruder, so uh, the object I mentioned before. And the extruder has been envisaged to be cohesive, for instance. Cohesive is another factor known to be involved in, in chromium organization. And uh, in this model, in the loop extrusion model, if you add uh, an attraction force between all the other sites in the chain, so in my, uh, my color scheme, the, the pink attract each other in, by some force which is, whose nature is not clear. But anyway, if you combine those ingredients, you see that you can explain, and comparatively well, uh, folding at, at low psi where CTC have, uh, is playing a major role. And I show you here uh, one example. This is experimental data. This is a, an experiment showing where CTCF peaks are. The color scheme is the one I mentioned before. So the, the two directions of those binding sides are highlighted by the different colors, red and, and, and green. And this is the result of, the, of that model. You see, this is an alternative. This is a Different scenario. It's not thermodynamics. It's off the equilibrium. There is a motor pulling out DNA. It works uh, neatly in, in this case. And it's, in a sense, it's simple. You only need CTCF and that motor. I've shown you that this cannot work in other cases, as the one I, I've discussed just before, but at least here it is working well. And the variant of this, though, is, uh, uh, is this called slip link model. It's a variant. The variant uh, this, uh, was introduced by Davide Marenduzzo and, and us. In this variant, the, you, you have a similar mechanism, but there is no need for active extrusion. So the idea is that your extruding factor binds here, and DNA starts moving randomly back and forth into that molecule. So you don't need to have an active extrusion mechanism, and so you do, do not burn energy. And the random sliding stops when one of the two CTCF sites enters into the, the machinery. So this is a variant of the one I showed before, uh, which is based on random diffusion. Technically speaking, though, this is not yet an equilibrium model, because this is a diffusion process with, with two absorbing boundaries, the CTCF sites. So if you had not the two CTCF sites, which stops the process, that would be a thermal process an equilibrium process. But since you have the two boundaries, this is not equilibrium, in the sense that distribution uh, is not the one you expect out of thermodynamics. 
because the, the diffusion stops at the two absorbing boundaries, at the two CTCF sites. So technically, this is also not equilibrium. Nevertheless, the slip link also works comparatively well. Um, and so what I wanted to, to try to do, uh, to try to wrap up this, is to compare the different cases and, and give you an overview of what we think in the literature now as the situation. So, by the way, what I'm showing you here is how the strings and binders model performs on the same locus, and you see that again, more or less, they, they perform similarly. So the advantage of the strings and binders is that this is a very simple thing, based on, on well-established uh, concepts of polymer physics, equilibrium, no need of energy. And additionally, uh, you don't make assumptions of what could be the factor. You derive the factors, which could be responsible for folding. But this is not a unique scenario. There are scenarios where you have off equilibrium process, in particular in the loop extrusion, regional loop extrusion, you also have an active mechanism. An active mechanism is known to occur uh, in the way in which cells work. And uh, to cut short a, a longer discussion, my personal impression is that we are now starting scratching at the surface of a world of complexity in the sense that it's very likely that real chromosomes are folded by different mechanisms. Some are those I illustrated to you. Thermodynamics, off equilibrium, active. But maybe there is more to discover about that. I told you that with the strings and binders, where we do not make assumptions on the factors, we derive the factors, we see that, say, 30% of the factors do not match with anything we know. So definitely there is a, a, an entire world of, of, of mechanisms which we have yet to discover. Though I hope I conveyed the, uh, the message that is... Um, with comparatively simple ingredients and concepts of theoretical physics, of statistical mechanics, we can start understanding uh, the mechanism of folding and then regulation of our genome. And it is uh, maybe those of you who will come to this field that is left open to, to, to delve further into that and to highlight the, I think, Road complexity of mechanism and factors which are involved into that. And the promises, of course, are, are formidable because we can understand how life works and we can really make huge advancements in, in medicine. So I want to wrap up and uh, maybe open the, the discussion if you have any comments or if you have any questions. And what I try to uh, discuss with you is that there are new technologies, as the GAM, which is the one we developed, which are allowing, which are revolutionizing this field because we have quantitative data as we have in physics. So it's not just a, an observation. Say, I see the chromosome fold. No, I can tell exactly how they fold experimentally. And this is opening, is paving the way to people like us. And I try to give you a sense of how chromosome folds starting from the data without having yet introduced the models. And the data themselves are showing a complexity of patterns, which have been heuristically named TADs, major TADs, and so on. But then by using physics, we can understand those patterns and the origin of those patterns, what TADs are, why they are so complicated sometimes, not just a, a neat triangle, and why there are major TADs, so high order interaction, and what are the factors responsible for that. And with polymer physics, we can explain the data with very high accuracy. And interestingly, we can make predictions, testable predictions, which are not only exciting from an intellectual point of view, as I said, but have significant medical implications. And uh, 
write me in case you are interested in this. We have uh, my groups in Naples and in Berlin. We have openings for postdoc and PhD. We like very good candidates. So if you like this and you have a good CV, write me and let's see how it goes. So I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions or any comment and want to open a discussion, ethical issues, whatever, just, just go ahead. Thank you.